Hi, I'm Mark Barsamian with the Ohio University Math Department. In the previous three sections, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, we discussed the plane separation axiom. This axiom uh, articulates the way that uh, a line splits the set of points into, um, into three sets, uh, consisting of the line itself and then two so-called half planes. And uh, we saw that some metric geometries, but not all of them, satisfy this plane separation axiom. They, they have that plane separation behavior that's desirable, but some don't, like the missing strip plane is a metric geometry that doesn't have that plane separation behavior. So then we defined a new class of geometries called the PASH geometries uh, to be those metric geometries that do satisfy that plane separation axiom. They do have that desirable plane separation behavior. Well, now in section 4.4, the subject of this video, we'll go from there. We'll be discussing past geometries. So those are geometries that satisfy that plane separation axiom. So geometries in which we have the idea of half planes created by a line. And we'll use that notion of half planes to uh, define what are called interiors of angles and interiors of triangles. So this is something that's possible only in a, in a, a geometry that has the notion of half plane, so only in PASH geometries. Now having defined these new sets, these, uh, these interiors of angles and interiors of half planes, then we set about doing what we uh, usually do in this sort of situation when, when a new object, a new kind of object gets introduced, we study its, kind, its relationship to, to, to objects that we've already introduced before. So we'll discuss the way that segments and lines and rays intersect these new things, these, these interiors of angles. So various theorems will, will articulate certain kinds of behavior. This material is produced for Ohio University Math 3110, 5110 College Geometry. The reading that corresponds to this video is section 4.4, Interiors in the Crossbar Theorem, from the book Geometry, a Metric Approach with Models by Millman and Parker. The corresponding homework is this collection of nine exercises from section 4.4. We'll start by discussing plane separation properties of the interiors of rays and segments. Now that's something that we had uh, in, a, in a metric geometry. We had rays and segments and interiors of rays and interiors of segments. Then we'll discuss what's called the Z theorem. And then finally we'll discuss interiors of angles and triangles. And then we'll start doing what I said we were going to do, discuss how our existing objects, lines and rays and segments, etc., uh, uh, intersect or in interact with uh, these new things, these interiors of angles and triangles. The first uh, exploration will be in this theorem called the crossbar theorem. And then we'll discuss briefly what's called the converse of the crossbar theorem. So let's recall some uh, old stuff. We've been using quite a bit lately this old corollary. If two lines are known to be distinct, then either they don't intersect at all or they intersect in exactly one point. In other words, two distinct lines cannot intersect in two points. And then uh, we're going to use this fact about the existence of points with certain betweenness relationships. So given two distinct points in a metric geometry, so a point A and a point B, maybe I'll illustrate those. The claim is there exist points C and D with these special betweenness relationships. So I'm going to make a new drawing showing those points C and D. I'll start by just copying the drawing that I have. So this theorem says that given two distinct points, that it's given this configuration, you can say that actually you have these two extra points, C and D, that have these uh, special betweenness relationships. Notice that claim I gives us point C. Claim double I gives us point D. So we'll be using this theorem, theorem 3.2.6, to say that certain points exist during the proofs that we'll study today. Now recall the definitions of segment and ray and in their interiors. 
Remember that the definition of a segment is segment AB consists of this set of points, point A, point B, and all points that are between A and B. The interior of that segment is the whole segment minus the endpoints. In other words, the interior of a segment is these points C that are between A and B. Now remember the definition of ray. Ray AB consists of point A and also all these other points that have these properties. Well, the interior of the ray is the whole ray minus the endpoint. So if we take out that point A, all that's left is those other points. Illustration of the interior of a segment would be this. The illustration of the interior of a ray would be this. So B is in the interior of ray AB, but point A is not in the interior. And then recall the plane separation axiom, which we're quite familiar with now, uh, given any line uh, in a geometry that satisfies the plane separation axiom, there are associated these two sets called half planes that satisfy these properties. And then remember the PSA 2 and 3 and their contrapositives, these four statements that we've been using quite a bit. And then remember Pasha's postulate. For every line and for every triangle, if a line intersects the side of the triangle at a point that's not a vertex, then the line intersects at least one of the opposite sides. And remember this theorem about two equivalent statements. This is a theorem that I stated in uh, the previous video, or actually two videos ago. It's not presented as a theorem in the book, but it's kind of a, a bundling up of some theorems that are presented in the book. The, this theorem says that for a metric geometry, the following two statements are equivalent. That is, they're either both true or they're both false. The statements are the geometry satisfies the plane separation axiom and the statement that the geometry satisfies Pash's postulate. And the definition of a Pash geometry is it is a metric geometry that satisfies the plane separation axiom. And so therefore, by this theorem, a Pash geometry is also going to be a geometry that satisfies Pash's postulate. Now, in the current section 4.4, we're going to discuss interiors and the crossbar theorem. Now, I want to start by discussing plane separation properties of interiors of rays and segments. Now, the plane separation axiom discusses some of the ways in which points and line segments intersect a line and its half planes. It'll be useful to articulate some more ways in which line segments intersect a line and its half planes, and to also consider the ways in which rays intersect a line and its half planes. For that, we'll start by considering convexivity properties. I'll point out, but won't prove, these convexivity properties of lines, rays, and segments, and their interiors. Now, I'm not going to prove, but I'm going to illustrate the fact that a line is a convex set. How do I do that? So there is an illustration of the fact that a line is a convex set. Remember what it means to be convex. If two distinct points are elements of the set, then the segment that connects those two points is a subset of that set. So that's an illustration of the fact that a line is a convex set. Well, the similar kind of illustration can be used for all of these. I think I won't subject you to sitting here while I make all these drawings. I think what I'll do is just simply do them and then resume the video when they're done. So uh, in just a second, those drawings will magically appear. OK, so there are our drawings. Each one of these pairs of drawings illustrates that one of those sets is a convex set. This drawing illustrates that a segment is a convex set. Now notice that all of these statements are statements that are true in any metric geometry. In metric geometries, we had these objects, lines, rays, segments, and their interiors. And we had the idea of convex sets. So all of these statements are things that we can say about a metric geometry, lines, rays, segments, and interiors in any metric geometry. 
Now, the following theorem is proven in a book. The proof is not difficult, so I won't discuss it here, but uh, I, maybe I will illustrate it. The theorem says, in a past geometry, if script A is a non-empty convex set that does not intersect line L, then all points of A lie on the same side of line L. Well, how do we illustrate that? Let's start by illustrating the hypothesis. All right, there's my uh, set A that does not intersect line L, so there's an illustration of the hypothesis. Now, how can I illustrate the conclusion? The conclusion says all points of A lie on the same side of L. Well, it sort of looks that way in this drawing, but how do we highlight that? How do we draw attention to, that, to what we're supposed to be observing? Well, let's make a new drawing. It might be easiest. So there is an illustration of the conclusion. Basically the same drawing, but it highlights the idea that we're supposed to be thinking about, that all the points of that set lie in the same half plane. Well, the proof of the following theorem is straightforward, so I won't discuss it here, but you'll prove it in a homework exercise. And your proof should use that uh, theorem 4.4.1. The theorem says this, in a past geometry, if script A is a line, or a ray, or a segment, or an interior of a ray, or interior of a segment, so one of those sets that we drew earlier, then uh, these two statements are true. If L is a line, and that set script A doesn't intersect that line, then all of script A lies on one side of line L. That's one statement of this theorem. Another statement is this. If three points A, B, C have that between this relationship and the intersection of line A, C and line L is just that point B in the middle, well then these two interiors lie on one side of line L and these two interiors lie on the other side of line L. So like I said, this theorem is not hard to prove, but it is worthwhile to make some drawings that illustrate the statement of the theorem. So let's make some illustrations of theorem 4.4.2, statement I, that says if L is a line and, the, and one of those sets of one of these types does not intersect the line, then all of that set lies on the same side of the line. I'll do a couple of examples of this. Okay, so here's a picture of a ray not intersecting a line. Here's a picture highlighting the fact that that entire ray lies on one side of the line. But I'm going to draw a more subtle picture. Okay, so here's a picture of an interior of a ray, that green set, that convex interior of that ray that does not intersect the line. Notice the ray intersects the line, but the endpoint of the ray is the only part of the ray that touches the line. So maybe I should highlight this point A in blue. It's, so that point A is part of the ray, but it's not part of the interior of the ray. So in this drawing over here, point A is part of the ray, but point A is not part of the interior of the ray. And you can see that in this right drawing, that green interior of the ray lies entirely in that red set, entirely in that red half plane. Now what about theorem 4.4.2 II? That's the statement that says, if points A, B, C have that between this relationship, B is between A and C, and line AC intersects line L at that middle point B, then these interiors have these properties. Well, let me make a drawing of that.
So there is an illustration of the conclusion. The conclusion says that that interior of that left ray stays in entirely in that uh, half plane. And also the interior of that segment, AB, uh, is colored red. The statement also says that the interior of the right ray, ray BC, the interior of that ray stays in that pink half plane. And the interior of segment BC also stays in that half plane. So again, you'll prove that in an exercise, but it's important to, to remember that this theorem is the theorem that allows us to say those sorts of things. Now I want to discuss the Z theorem. This theorem is easily proven using that previous theorem that we just discussed. See the book for a proof of that. The theorem says, in a past geometry, if P and Q are on opposite sides of line AB, then ray PQ and ray AQ do not intersect. That is, their intersection is the empty set. And in particular, segment BP and segment AQ don't intersect. That is, their intersection is the empty set. So again, I won't discuss the proof of this theorem, but uh, I will illustrate it. So first of all, let's make an illustration of the hypothesis. Let's make an illustration of points P and Q being on opposite sides of some line AB. So there's an illustration of the hypothesis. Now let's illustrate the conclusion. The conclusion says that those two rays don't intersect. Well, I'm going to start by copying this drawing. So there's an illustration of those rays not intersecting. Notice I've gotten rid of all the other stuff that's not mentioned in this conclusion. The conclusion doesn't mention the line, doesn't mention the half planes, it just mentions that those rays don't intersect. So that's what this theorem says. Now why is it called the Z theorem? Well, it's called the Z theorem because if you if you kind of squint your eyes and look at the the hypothesis drawing, you can kind of imagine uh, the letter Z in that drawing. So that's helpful. This this drawing uh, will be coming up later in this video. We're going to have situations where we can spot this kind of behavior, spot a Z configuration of four points in a drawing, and use that as justification for a statement about two uh, rays not intersecting. Now I'm ready to discuss interiors of angles and triangles. Now first we'll start by discussing some more descriptive half-plane notation that I use that's not used in the book. This symbol, capital H with the subscript line AB and, and point C, you can use when A, B, and C are non-collinear points in a past geometry. And what it means is this symbol denotes the half plane of line AB that contains point C. So let's make an illustration of that. So there's a picture of what I would call the half plane of line AB that contains C, and I would denote it with this symbol. So this is just simply a more descriptive symbol for half plane. That will enable us to give a very clean definition of angle and triangle interiors. This symbol, interior of angle ABC, is how it's spoken, means this set the intersection of two half planes. So let me see if I can draw that. So there's the drawing showing that the intersection of this half plane and this half plane is this angle interior. 
Similarly, the interior of a triangle denoted this way is an intersection of three half planes. Now remember I said at the start of the video that we would introduce this new idea of interiors of angles and triangles and then set about discussing the relationship between uh, those new things, those angle and triangle interiors, and some of our, our old objects. Uh, so here's our first theorem about that. Uh, theorem 4.4.6. Given an angle, ABC, in a past geometry, if P is a point that's between A and C, then P is in the interior of angle ABC. Now you'll justify and illustrate the steps in a given proof of that theorem in your homework. But what I'm going to do is illustrate uh, uh, the statement of the theorem. So I'll start with a, an illustration of the given stuff. There is an angle with a point P that has the property that P is between A and C. So there is a drawing of the given stuff. Now we have to draw the conclusion, this stuff. How do we convey that P is in the interior of that angle? Well, I'll make a drawing like this. So there's an illustration of the statement of the theorem. Now observe this immediate consequence, or a corollary of that theorem. In a past geometry, all of the points in the interior of one side of a triangle are in the interior of the opposite angle. That is, in any triangle ABC, the following subset relationship is true. The interior of that side of the triangle is a subset of the interior of the opposite angle. Let me see if we can illustrate that with a drawing. So there's a drawing showing the exact same interior of a segment twice. Um, the first drawing just shows that it's the interior of one of the sides of the triangle. The second drawing shows that it's a subset of that half plane. Now I want to discuss another theorem about the, uh, the relationship between our old objects, lines, rays, segments, etc., and our new objects, these interiors of things. So the theorem is a very important theorem called the crossbar theorem. It says this, in a past geometry, if a point is in the interior of an angle, then the ray from the vertex of the angle through that point intersects this segment AC at this unique point F, such that AFC. Now I didn't give us room to illustrate this. Maybe I'll make a small drawing here. Okay, so there's an illustration of the statement of the theorem. If this stuff is true, you have a point P in the interior of angle ABC, then this stuff is true. Ray BP intersects segment AC at a point F that's between A and C. So now let's start uh, justifying and illustrating the proof. First notice the proof structure. The proof starts with statement one that is a statement of a hypothesis. And then look at how the proof ends. The proof ends with the statement of the conclusion. So that's just what we'd expect. So statement one is the statement of the hypothesis and we're supposed to illustrate that. Well we've already got an illustration of the hypothesis sitting up here. Let's just copy that and take it down. Now statement two says there exists a point E such that B is between E and C. We're supposed to justify that and illustrate it. Well, I'm going to start by just illustrating it. There's an illustration of that between this relationship. Now how do we justify it? Well, that's justified by that theorem that I presented in the review at the beginning of the video. 
that theorem says that if you have two given points, then you're guaranteed that there exists some other points that have certain betweenness relationships with those given points. Now, notice that my justification mentioned that theorem and also mentioned how I applied it. I applied it to given points C and B in that order because point E is out beyond the second point. Statement 3 says Pasha's postulate is satisfied. We're supposed to justify that. Well, remember, statement 1 says that the plane separation axiom is satisfied because we're, we're in a Pash geometry. And then we have that theorem, theorem 4.3.1, that says that if a metric geometry satisfies the, the plane separation axiom, then it also satisfies Pash's postulate. That's part of that um, theorem that I mentioned earlier that I uh, called theorem about two equivalent statements in a metric geometry. The plane separation axiom and Pash's postulate are always either both true or both false in a metric geometry. Statement 4 says line BP intersects segment AE or segment AC. Now we need to justify that. Well, I'm going to start by illustrating it. So here's the illustration that I want to make. This is the illustration of the hypothesis of Pasha's postulate. We have a line, BP, that intersects a triangle, AEC, at a point B that is between E and C. So Pasha's postulate then says, therefore, that line, BP, intersects either that side or that side, or maybe both. Now, part two of the, th of the proof is to show that this green line, BP, does not intersect this segment, AE. Now, in this drawing, it doesn't look like it's going to, but that's just an informal drawing. We have to prove that that's true by, by words. Well, the way that we do that is we first notice that P and C are on the same side of AB. Now, why is that? Well, it's because um, P is known to be in the, in the interior. So P is known to be in that angle, interior, by statement 1. But what is this angle interior defined to be? It's defined to be the intersection of these two half planes. So if P is in this interior, then it's in both of these half planes. So we're allowed to say that P is for sure in that half plane. So let's illustrate that. So there's an illustration of half plane BA, comma C, and the fact that points P and C are both in there. Statement 6 says that C and E are on opposite sides of line AB. Now we need to justify that and we need to illustrate that. Well, let's uh, start by illustrating it. So there is the illustration. Now how do we know this? Well, by statement 1 and statement 4, we know that line AB intersects EC at a point B such that B is between E and C. Now why is that from statements 1 and 4? In statement 1, we knew about this angle, uh, angle ABC. So that tells us that uh, line AB intersects line BC at vertex B. But in statement 4, we introduce this point E that has this certain betweenness relationship. And so uh, that's where we get the fact that B is between E and C. Well, notice, since this stuff is true, this line intersects that segment at that point that's between the endpoints of the segment, PSA2 contrapositive tells us that C and E are not in the same half plane. Remember, to prove that kind of statement, you always have to use one of those PSA2 or PSA3 
um, statements or their contrapositives. And so therefore, P and E are on opposite sides of AB. That's by the previous two statements. In statement 5, P and C are on the same side of the line. In statement 6, C and E are on opposite sides. So statement 7, P and E are on opposite sides. So let's illustrate that. So there's an illustration that P and E are on opposite sides of AB. Now I'm going to shrink this a little bit. Now statement 8 says that ray BP and ray AE don't intersect. We have to illustrate that and justify it. Well, let's justify it first. The justification is by the Z theorem. Notice in this diagram up above, there's a Z. That's our heads up that we can use the Z theorem. Now, how are we going to illustrate this? Well, let's just copy our existing drawing and bring it down and highlight those rays that don't intersect. So there are those two rays that don't intersect. There's an illustration of them not intersecting. Step 9 says there exists a point Q such that P, B, Q. Uh, we need to uh, illustrate that. I didn't say to illustrate it, but we need to illustrate it and justify it. So let's uh, just draw those three points. Well, there's the illustration, and the justification is that theorem from back in section 3.2 about the existence of certain points with particular betweenness relationships. Given two distinct points, B and P, that theorem tells us that there exists this point Q that has this particular betweenness relationship. All right, statement 10 says that Q and P are on opposite sides of BC, which is the same line as EC. Now let's think about how this is going to be justified. How can we ever justify that two points are on opposite sides of a line? We always have to use PSA2 contrapositive. And what's the setup? Well, the setup has to be show that the line intersects the segment at some point that's between the endpoints of the segment. So let's make the illustration for this. So there's an illustration of the fact that P and Q are on opposite sides of BC. Now statement 11 says P and A are on the same side of BC. Now that's going to be justified in the same way that we had a, a similar statement justified before. When we said that P and C are on the same side of AB, we just used the fact that P is known to be in the interior of that angle. Well now we're claiming that P and A are on the same side of BC, well, that's justified because, again, P is in the interior of that angle. And that angle is defined to be the intersection of these two half planes. So therefore, P is definitely in that particular half plane. So let's uh, illustrate this uh, with a drawing. P and A are on the same side of BC. So there's an illustration showing half plane of line BC containing point A and showing that point P is in there. Statement 12 says that Q and A are on opposite sides of BC. Now how do we justify that? Well, that's by 10 and 11. In 10 we said that P and Q are on opposite sides, and in 11 we said that P and A are on the same side, so therefore Q and A are on opposite sides. So how do we illustrate that? Well, we'll just draw those half planes and, and put Q and A on opposite sides. There's an illustration showing Q and A on opposite sides of BC. Statement 13 says these two things don't intersect, BQ and segment AE. They, their intersection is the empty set. Well, the justification is by the Z-theorem. 
notice in our drawing, there's a Z. So that Z is our kind of our heads up that we can use the Z theorem. So we're going to apply the Z theorem to points Q and A that are on opposite sides of line BC. So how do we illustrate this? Well, let's just copy this drawing, bring it down, and highlight those rays that don't intersect. So there is a picture of that ray and that segment not intersecting. Statement 14 says that line BP is equal to the union of ray BP and ray BQ. We, we have to justify and illustrate that. Well, I'm going to start by illustrating it. There's a picture of those two rays, and you see that line BP, it makes sense that line BP is the union of these two rays. Now that was actually proven back in a homework exercise, one of your suggested exercises. Uh, the suggested exercise says that if P is a point of that line BQ that is not on ray BQ, then this equality is true. It's a weird way of saying it. I think a, a nicer way of saying it is if three points have this between this relationship, then the union of these two rays equals the whole line. Now why do we need to say this? Why do we need to say that line BP is equal to the union of these two rays? Well that's going to show up here. In statement 15, we say that line BP does not intersect segment AE at all. We have to justify it. Well, why is that? Back in statement 8, we showed that ray BP, this red ray, doesn't intersect that green segment. Now I should have drawn that as a segment. So that red ray doesn't in intersect that green segment. We showed that in statement 8. In statement 13, we showed that this ray doesn't intersect that same segment. And then in statement 14, we said those two rays make up that whole line. And so by 8, 13, and 14, we can say that the whole line does not intersect that segment. So let's draw that. So there's an illustration of that whole line, BP, not intersecting that segment. All right, proof part three. Prove that ray BP must intersect segment AC. Well, why is that? Well, let's go back to uh, statement four. In statement four, we use Pasha's postulate to say that line BP has to intersect either that segment AE or that segment AC. That's in statement four. Now in statement 15, we prove that that blue line does not intersect that green segment AE. So therefore, the line has to intersect the other one of those segments. So let's illustrate that. So there's an illustration of line BP intersecting segment AC. Now statement 17 says that ray BQ does not intersect that segment. Now, where would that come from, that a ray does not intersect a segment? Well, let's go back to statement 12 and look at our drawing. In statement 12, we've got this configuration of points. Notice in that configuration of points, there's a Z. It's kind of a, a, a wacky looking Z, but it is a Z. So we're going to apply the Z theorem to these two points that lie on opposite sides of this line. So an illustration of this statement would be the following. So there's an illustration of that ray BQ in that segment AC not intersecting.
And again, it's from using that Z theorem. Those points uh, are in a kind of a Z. Statement 18 says that therefore ray BP must intersect segment AC. Now why is that? Let's go back up and look at statement 16. Statement 16 says that line BP, that blue line, has to intersect that segment. And then statement 14 says that that line is made up of two rays. And statement 17 says that of those two rays, that one ray doesn't intersect that segment. So therefore, it's got to be the other ray that intersects that segment. So it's by those three statements. Let's make an illustration. So there's our illustration of that statement that BP must intersect segment AC. So that's the end of proof part two. Now in proof part three, we're going to prove a property of the intersection of that ray and that segment. Now what's the property that we're going to try to prove? We're going to try to prove that it is at a point that's between A and C. Now that's just the way that I drew it, but, but how do we know that that's got to be true? We should justify this with, with words. Well, first of all, the intersection of that line and the segment has to be a single point by that corollary that says that two distinct lines cannot intersect in more than one point. So we can call that intersection point F. Now what can we say about F? Well, we know that F can't be point A. Why? Well, because if, if that was point A, then that would mean that this line would be line AB. And we know that point P cannot be on line AB because P is in the interior of angle ABC. So that point of intersection cannot be point A. Similarly, we can say that that point of intersection can't be point C. So the only remaining choice is that point of intersection is some point F that's between A and C. So in other words, exactly like I drew it. So I'm going to draw that again. And there we go. We've got this point F, that's the point of intersection, and we've proven that it's between A and C. So we've proven that ray BP intersects AC, and we've proven it intersects at a point F that's between A and C. And actually, that's the illustration that I drew already. I'm going to move it down. And that's the end of the proof of the, of the uh, crossbar theorem. Now I want to talk about the converse of the crossbar theorem. Recall that a conditional statement, that is a statement of the form if A then B, is logically equivalent to its contrapositive, if not B then not A. As a result of this, anytime you prove a theorem that has the form of a conditional statement, you automatically know that the contrapositive version of the same statement is automatically true. The contrapositive statement is not another theorem. It's just a different way of saying the theorem that's already been proven. But the original statement is not logically equivalent to the converse, if B then A. So as a result of this, when a known theorem has the form of a conditional statement, the converse statement is not automatically true. That is, the converse statement is not just a different way of saying the theorem that's been proven. If the converse statement is true, then it constitutes another theorem, and it'll have to be proven with a new proof. Well, that's the situation with the crossbar theorem. The crossbar theorem is a conditional statement. The crossbar theorem says if this is true, P is in the interior of that angle, then this is true, ray BP intersects segment AC at a point F that's between A and C. That's a conditional statement. The converse statement is this. Given an angle, if BP intersects the interior of segment AC, then P is in the interior of the angle. So that's the converse of the statement of the crossbar theorem. So this is actually a true statement. It's a theorem. It has to be proven as a new theorem because it's not the same as the crossbar theorem. 
It's the converse of the statement of the crossbar theorem. Now, let's draw an illustration of this. The hypothesis is this drawing. Ray BP intersects the interior of segment AC. And the conclusion is this. Point P is in the interior of angle ABC. Now, I'm not going to go through the proof of this. You will actually uh, prove the theorem in one of your suggested exercises. Now, that might seem kind of daunting, but here's a hint. In some of your assigned homework exercises, on homework 6, problems 3 and 4, you study and write proofs that are about proving that a point is in the interior of some angle, or proving that some set of points is a subset of the interior of some angle. The same kind of techniques used in those two assigned homework problems will be useful for this suggested exercise. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you.